It's pleasing that CHSTM is making this video to commemorate, as it were, the Anglo-American Conference, the first Anglo-American Conference, which was held here for 25 years to the month before this wonderful international meeting uh, that we're celebrating in 2013. Now, how did this come about? Well, there was an interaction with the International Conference. It was Ron Numbers, who was then the Programme Secretary of the American Society of the HSS, who decided that the international meetings were not doing all that they hoped for, and that perhaps they should try, additionally, another format. And he discussed with John Brooke, uh, who's then helping to run the British Society for the History of Science, about whether they could be an Anglo-American meeting. And John Brooke came on to me because I'd just become the Programme Secretary of the British Society for the History of Science. And we were very pleased to host it in Manchester. It gives a chance to, to rethink, in a sense, what we could do with a conference of this sort. And we decided locally, with some uh, taking up advice from colleagues elsewhere, that as far as possible we would have the morning session based on discussion of pre-circulated papers. Of course, I depended on getting the uh, pre-circulated papers, and 25 years ago this was all done on paper, and it was Ron Numbers at uh, the American end at uh, uh, Madison who organised all the, uh, the printing, and then they were shipped over to, to Manchester for distribution for the conference. And by and large, it worked pretty well. In the afternoon, we had the usual sessions that were put together from papers that were offered individually or in small groups. Okay, in 1988, two years after the foundation for the Centre of the History of Science, Technology and Medicine here in the University of Manchester, there was an extraordinary Anglo-American conference which covered the history of science, the history of technology and the history of medicine all in one huge event which took place just very near here in the School of, uh, the School of Architecture. Another reason that meeting was novel was that it focused very much on the 19th and 20th centuries and nowadays it would seem absolutely obvious to bring science, technology and medicine together to focus on the 19th and 20th centuries but in, in the 1980s that was still really surprisingly novel. So I'm very much looking forward to the, the great conference uh, uh, that we have here in Manchester this week, much bigger in scale, also integrating science, technology and medicine also focusing on the 19th and, uh, and, uh, and 20th century to see how things have developed in what is a quarter of a century of historical writing uh, to be taken uh, account of. Let's see what it looks like at the end of this week. And I was at UMIST when I attended the 1988 conference. Now at the time I was doing a PhD on spontaneous generation, actually with Mick Warboy as a supervisor, that was at Sheffield Poly as was, so it's rather interesting I've ended up back there. Um, but uh, I was in a computation department at UMIST and I was developing some material on gender and artificial intelligence and this paper at the 1988 conference was really my first attempt to present that to a public. So I wasn't quite sure how it would go. I called my paper, Will Expert Systems Be Male? But I managed to get a typo into the, typo, uh, the title. And of course that just went in because it's camera ready copy. And uh, I turned up the conference and I gave my paper and I, I, I kind of had this feeling of, oh, nobody's rumbled me, it's all right. And that was the beginning of a, for me, quite an industry on gender and artificial intelligence. That was my very first paper on that. Um, and I was on a, a platform with a very illustrious group um, Ruth Schwartz Cowan, you know, uh, more work for mother, and Cynthia Coburn, who was the, um, uh, she no longer works in the field, but really was very much the expert in gender and technology. Now, the over, um, for me, the thing I remember most about the conference was the fact that I had a very young baby. My son was, I think, four weeks old. And uh, I found that I was not one of these relaxed mothers, I'm not, I'm not now, and I found it impossible to literally to juggle him and get to, 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 to papers in the conference. And I was breastfeeding him, and uh, I've since met women who, who were able to kind of breastfeed the baby to sleep, deliver their paper, and the baby works, work, wakes up cheerful after the, the presentation. That didn't work for me, so my husband came along with the baby. Uh, and, interestingly, there was a, a, kind of a, cre a little bit of a crash at this conference. I noticed there's nothing like that now. So what, what happens if you do have a very little baby, I wonder. But anyway, <laughs> I see Jeff over there. One of the, one of the uh, conference uh, people um, 
said, oh, oh you're gonna be, maybe, maybe your son would like to go and play with some Lego in the creche. And uh, we're talking about a four-week-old baby. So all I can say is this shows a woeful lack of child development. And this is someone who has since then become a very eminent historian of technology. I won't tell you who it is. And, uh, 25 years on, it's quite, it's quite strange to be you know, back in a huge conference, much huger, of course, um, this time. Uh, and because I am not encumbered by small people, <laughs> Um, he's, a, he's a big math teacher in Leeds now, um, you know, I'm able to enjoy and, and, uh, and, and what's interesting to me is it's amazing how many of the old timers are still around. So it's a great, really great experience for this and a great, I think, be able to dip into all sorts of different sessions, uh, maybe things that are not in one's field. I should just say that I, I'm one of the few people who was also at the last British International Congress, which was in 1977 in Edinburgh. I was of course very young at the time uh, and there's a few of us who were there. I just finished my undergraduate degree. I'd you know, done work in the science studies unit um, as an undergraduate with Steve Chapin and so on. So I was at that uh, that congress, the early congress. Um, how many years ago is that? 36 years ago. Well of course nothing nothing like this one. Uh, and must have been, it was poor Eric Forbes that, uh, that you know <laughs> was, was organising that and really must have been a nightmare to organise of course without all the modern communication. So, I feel I've been around for a long time, dipping in and out of these things, but it's nice to be back and nice to enjoy as much of it as I, I, I want to this time. Hello, my name is Christopher Hamlin. I'm from the University of Notre Dame, and I was here in 1988, and I'm here again in 2013. And I don't remember very much about the 1988 meeting, except that Julie Shackelford and I went for, we had an extra day, we went for a long, long walk along a canal. and. Um, it, as Jolie remembers it, it missed it. And it missed it so much that his passport got completely soaked and when he went to leave the next day, they thought he'd put his passport through the washing machine. Um, so that seems to be the, the most significant thing that we can remember. Um, I was just looking at the program and I do, I had forgotten completely about what my paper was about. Uh, and now I remember and um, I think things, the field has moved on since then, but that was um, a good moment for my field, the history of public health, and there's some very good sessions here this time, um, which I've been involved in, that have to do both with uh, public health and medicine and also forensic science, which is becoming a new field that nobody had thought of at all in 1988. Thanks. In 1988, uh, I was here, and I find I was talking about um, the Society for Psychical Research and uh, observations of the spirits. And I'd come that way because uh, looking at 19th century respectable sciences, like chemistry and biology and so on, I concluded this wasn't the whole picture. Now one had to look at the sciences which hadn't worked, the sciences which didn't seem respectable, uh, and that psychical research in, in the later 19th century was a very important part, actually, uh, of what the scientific community was up against uh, and was sort of reacting to and being sympathetic to or not, as the case might be. And uh, that produced quite a good sympathetic response among the audience, anyway, the ones who were there with, with me there. But I remember being struck when later on I gave a somewhat similar paper to the Society for the History of Philosophy, uh, and while they thought this was a curious thing and that Henry Sidgwick and uh, Arthur Balfour and so on had been mixed up with psychical research, nevertheless, it wasn't really the sort of thing that was history of philosophy, was it? So anyway, that, that was uh, an entertaining difference, that Greek history was alive and well in the history of philosophy. Well, I think the 1988 meeting in Manchester I think for a lot of people it was a real turning point. Certainly the thing that struck me about it most was that within the British history of science scene, the sociology of knowledge um, with various groups at Edinburgh, Bath and other places had really been moving forward in the five, ten years before that. And a lot of historians of science were taking that kind of material very seriously within the British scene. I think for a lot of the people from North America who came to the meeting, learning about that kind of work was really a revelation. I think what it meant was that you came to the meeting and there were a lot of people immediately concerned with sociology of knowledge here. That's something that isn't so characteristic of the meeting in Manchester in the 21st century, but I think the long-term effects of that interaction are still very much with us. A concern about the social making of knowledge, a concern about how knowledge circulates among different groups of people, and really about thinking about science as a social activity in its actual details.
And I think that was really a crucial moment in terms of the field. I think for a lot of people also, it was a way in which the kind of full blossoming of, of history of science as a historical subject really came about. I know I've talked to people in areas ranging from the you know, work on gender and science, really it's the work on the science of the revolution, to work on science in the media. There were a lot of things that were happening in, in both in the United, United States and in Canada and in North and in Britain, which really came together in a new way in this. It, it liberated a lot of people to think about these questions more historically. Thinking more specifically, I mean, my, I had a session that I organized, which was in some ways a bit of a disaster. It was, it was supposed to have four speakers. One withdrew because they couldn't get here through travel about three weeks before. One withdrew the week before. And then the final withdrawal was 10 minutes before the session started. The advantage of this was that we actually were able to have a session which was devoted specifically to science and film. And it was a great session. It was one of the first times people were really getting into questions of of science for larger audiences and science in the media, science and visual imagery. And because of it, we were able to show extra bits of the film that was involved, and we had a very good discussion. One of the things that really struck me about it, though, I remember there was one moment in the whole presentation when some, everybody just laughed at what was going on in the film. And, um, and one of the historians, I, I won't mention her name, um, got up during immediately after this and more or less shamed us for having laughed during the middle of this film. We suddenly all felt very small and very kind of, you know, politically incorrect in a certain way. And um, I remember that as a kind of really particular moment at the, the meeting in terms of thinking about the difficulties of what it was to analyze these kind of much more popular media and thinking about those issues. So for me, it was a great meeting. I think it's in many ways stands out for me as a real moment in the, the, the making of the way that history of science, medicine, and technologies actually conducted even even now. I think it's had a quite a long-term permanent effect. Um, and I've even said that in print. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, I'm Frank James. I'm Professor of History of Science at the Royal Institution and at University College London. And in 1988 I was on the Council of the British Society of History of Science as news editor. And in that role um, I must have been one of the people who decided it would be a good idea to have a collaborative meeting uh, just with the Americans at that point, the Canadians came on board uh, later. Uh, it was a hugely successful meeting here uh, in Manchester. Uh, and I sort of always remember my, what they circulated sort of rather long-ish abstracts that the papers presented, and you had a very short time to sort of talk about them. And so, in the end, I was basically reading my own abstract, which I did now I was uh, still quite young at that point. It's really not a sort of particularly sensible thing uh, to do. Uh, but we had. Um, a wonderful social time. We went uh, to sort of Chinatown for the uh, Congress dinner. Um, I can't remember the precise size of that meeting, but it was probably in the sort of range of two to three hundred. So really quite large in terms of meetings held in the 1980s. Uh, this meeting here is sort of about four or five times as large, and I've been basically involved in getting in, getting this meeting on the ground. And I can now realise how much hard work we did in the uh, late 80s, 1988, which was an American meeting, which at the time I didn't really appreciate. And I fully appreciate how much work was done then. My name's Leslie Cormack, and I'm at the University of Alberta. Uh, I have a very clear memory of the uh, 1988 uh, conference that was here in Manchester. I was just finishing up my PhD at the University of Toronto, and the yeah, live from the aircraft had come out not that long before. The graduate students have been handing it around like a piece of sort of illicit uh, literature because none of our faculty, none of our supervisors wanted to hear anything about that odd, rich thing that was happening. And so my story about the 1988 uh, meeting is that that's the meeting with a strong program that came to North America. That we showed up at this meeting and it was so interesting because the big American names all assumed that they would be the stars of the, of the meeting and walked in and, and, and it's assumed that everyone in Britain would know who they were. I especially remember Everett Mendelssohn thinking that everyone would know he was from Harvard when he came in with me and I said I was from Toronto and so the person greeting us said, oh, Tim, are you from the University of Toronto as well? So that was quite interesting. But there, there was a full day on the scientific revolution. My, my area is the scientific revolution. 
Revolution. And it started with circulated papers, which included the just finishing uh, uh, PhD student, who had this amazing new take on patronage in Galileo, which was very exciting. Uh, and it ended, the last session of the day was a session with me and Paula Finland called Renaissance Maps and Jokes. And both of us thought no one will come to this, pay this session because the, the topic is so crazy. But in fact, everyone stayed for the full day and it was, it was this complete rethink of the science of revolution that made me realize that I could be uh, a historian of science. And so for me, and, and I, I've talked to Mario about this too, that that's what, that's what made him decide not to quit the biz because of the, of the Manchester meeting. So it really was probably the most important meeting that I've ever been to. Well, I was lucky to get to the 1988 meeting at all because I was then uh, living and working in California, uh, teaching at the San Diego campus of the University of California. Uh, and I hadn't been in the US for very long, and I was still trying to get my green card, for, um, which would allow me to live and work permanently in Berlin. What they would pleased to call a permanent resident alien and that process required me to be remain in the US for 12 months without break and I had to get very special permission to come out of the US back to the UK for three for precisely three weeks of what they were pleased to call parole. So I was on parole when I came to Manchester for this conference and uh, but, um, yes, I, I have vivid memories of the conference. It was a very good one. One of my memories is that it rained almost non-stop for the whole of the conference, except on the day when we all went on a, uh, an excursion into Derbyshire to see Chatsworth. Uh, when it came, the sun came out, it was a lovely day. I'm probably exaggerating that, but it did seem that it rained all the time, but it didn't matter because the conference is so good, it didn't matter being... Uh, now, much more important is I, I the, the, the session that I was part of, and which I'd been invited to, to participate in, um, really uh, symbolizes some of the things that were going on at that time in our field. The, the, the title of the uh, session, or to, yes, the title of the session was Sociological Approaches to the History of Science Technology, History of Science, Science and Technology. Uh, and it was still a period when, for a great many historians of science, um, sociology was the dreaded S word that they were very scared of. Um, and we were tackling, we, these were, um, uh, papers were giving, given, um, which were uh, addressing the issues of so the sociology of scientific knowledge, Harry Collins and the Edinburgh School, so called, were, um, were, were prominent in this, and I'd been very much influenced by them and uh, found it very attractive. And I, I gave myself gave a, a, a sort of postscript to my big book on the Great Devonian Controversy, which had been published, I think, just three years earlier. Uh, and we had a wonderful debate. Uh, I was a very, very good, friendly argument with, with I remember, with Harry Collins and, uh, and others about uh, my interpretation of that particular comics. So uh, that was, the, for me, the high, well, it was the, the little bit that I contributed directly to the conference, and therefore perhaps that's my strongest memory. But it was a very good conference, and it did come at a, at a really exciting time in the history of our field, and I can hardly believe that it's 25 years ago. <laughs> Well, in 1988 I became president of the British Society for the History of Science and I was told that we had this arrangement with the History of Science Society to hold a joint meeting in Manchester, the first of its kind. I was very pleased indeed to be able to be involved in that kind of way. Um, the meeting, um, I seem to remember, was a relatively large meeting. Um, I think there have been three and four hundred people here, nearly all of course from um, the UK or from the United States. And I thought it was a fairly even mixture of, um, of academics from both, both sides. Um, there are a number of um, sessions which overlapped, as always happens, 
But I do seem to remember that you could actually dash from one, you could flip from one to the other, and actually get to most of what you wanted as long as the um, as long as the chem were keeping careful time. I didn't actually present the paper myself at that meeting. I had done on many occasions before, but I was asked to um, do an after-dinner speech um, with Mary Jo Nye, my American counterpart. And I remember that the banquet, the um, banquet was held in a, a very large Chinese restaurant. Which I imagine was quite an unusual sort of thing to happen, rather than a, a tedious um, university dining room. It was a very pleasant occasion. It was very noisy. It was very hot. I gave a speech. I can't remember what I said, but um, I think it was I think it was reasonably well received. I've got photographs from that occasion actually, which um, which, which um, like some people have shown interest in just recently. Um, I think that's probably all I really need to say about the meeting. Um, the program, of course, exists in an archive, and it can be looked at. It's very interesting, actually, to see how many people who were at that meeting in 1988 are back here in 2013. I think it's actually quite a surprisingly large proportion. Of course, sadly, some people are no longer with us, um, and some people um, presumably have decided not to come to this. Um, but, you know, the history of science moves on. Um, there's a, it's, a, it's a community which changes constantly, and that is all to the good.